Welcome back to Polygamy, An Enemy Has Done This. This is a series that uses Latter-day Saints scripture and doctrine to make the case that women and men are foundationally equal in God's plan, and that God's plan does not include polygamy, not here on earth, nor in the eternities. As an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I've noticed that the confusion that surrounds gender and marriage in our society at large is also prevalent in our church. And I believe this is in large part due to our belief that the doctrine of many wives and concubines comes from God. I believe that when we truly understand who women are, who we have always been, and who we are divinely ordained to be, that light and knowledge will enable us to have an astoundingly clarifying effect for good in this world. I believe that when we embrace the truth about who women are, and by extension, who men are, and who God is. When we, to quote the scripture, embrace the truth and look upward, then shall Zion look downward, and all the heavens shall shake with gladness, and the earth shall tremble with joy. That scripture from Joseph Smith's new translation of Genesis is just the first half of an incredible promise that I really want to live to see. I hope you do too. Now, because this topic of polygamy encompasses marriage and sexuality, and our physical, emotional, and spiritual experiences in those relationships, I expect that we'll really run the gamut of emotions in this series, from horrific to hilarious, from tender to tragic. I think the story of Adam and Eve that we discussed in the Creation Template episode is wonderfully tender, to see how God established a pattern of equality based in love and unity It's just beautiful. Today, we discuss something that to me is deeply tragic. I'm going to hold off on explaining just what about it is tragic until later in the episode, though, because I think it will make more sense if we try to parse the story a bit first. When members of the church talk about polygamy, I'm always surprised that we don't start by discussing the first polygamist, because the initial establishment of something gives us an indication of its true nature. This is the underlying doctrine of Christ's parable of the wheat and the tares. God does not plant bad seeds, and Satan doesn't plant good ones. It may be hard to distinguish between or disentangle the bad seeds from the good seeds until suddenly they're ready to harvest. I'm actually recording this episode today at a beautiful botanical garden because I don't want to focus on the bad. I'd like to celebrate how truly awe-inspiring God's many good seeds are. We use this principle of seeds of origination to justify our doctrine of marriage. When we say that marriage is between a man and a woman and that it's ordained of God, for example, we're drawing upon the scriptural record to make that claim. So it certainly stands to reason that in discussing the doctrinal validity of polygamy, we would begin by discussing who started polygamy. Now, if you believe in the divinity of polygamy, You already know who started it, don't you? Don't you? Well, for most of my life, even though I believed and was horrified that polygamy came from God, I didn't actually know who started it. I mean, I assumed Abraham. And if you go by our topical guide, that's actually where you'll be pointed. It's not under a heading called polygamy. That heading just directs you to a heading named plural marriage. And actually, in a real mixed message, The plural marriage heading tells you to see also apostasy of individuals. Anyway, the earliest scriptural reference to polygamy in the topical guide is the story of Abraham and Sarah. So if that's what you guessed too, you're in good company. But it was actually during our most recent Old Testament study, when I had already come to be fully persuaded by creation's witnesses that polygamy was temporal, that I did a massive double take at Genesis 4 and Moses 5, when I realized the first polygamist was a descendant of Cain, and he also entered into covenant with Satan and became Master Mayhem. Now, before we go over the story of this man whose name was Lamech, let's do a super quick review of the characteristics of Satan. In the Apostle John's revelation of the war in heaven, we get Satan's backstory. Because of his attempt to destroy our agency through a plan which was almost identical to God's, Satan became identified as one who deceiveth the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
And throughout the millennia, being a liar, a deceiver, that has really been one of Satan's defining characteristics. In our dispensation, Joseph Smith received a revelation in response to his special inquiry on the manifestations of different spirits abroad in the earth. Quote, Verily I say unto you, there are many spirits which are false spirits, which have gone forth in the earth, deceiving the world. And also, Satan hath sought to deceive you, that he might overthrow you. End quote. And just to point out, the saints were warned in 1831, that's when this revelation was given, that Satan was actively trying to deceive them, that false spirits were manifesting to them, and that abominations were beginning to enter into the church. Something to keep in the back of our minds throughout this series on polygamy. Satan has many tactics, but they all involve this element of deception. He tries to persuade us that wickedness is happiness, that black is white, that night is day. And I think it's important to acknowledge, Satan doesn't come up with his own ideas. He just takes God's plan, alters it slightly, and tries to pass it off as having the same work. When somebody does this with temporal things, we call it counterfeit. And yes, if you're watching the video, that picture was taken in China, where you can purchase your very own gear with a Nairi swoosh. But when someone takes eternal truth, alters it slightly, and tries to pass it off as having the same worth, that's not just counterfeit. God calls that perversion. So let's jump into the story of Satan's first really successful deception among mortals. Cain, of course, was the first murderer. He was one of those carnal, sensual, and devilish men who loved Satan more than God. Cain swore to keep Satan's secret, and Satan swore to do according to Cain's commands. And this covenantal relationship with evil enabled Cain to become Master Mayhem. Now, the title Master Mayhem does not appear in the book of Genesis, just Joseph Smith's new translation. So we don't have these scriptures in Hebrew, but the footnote tells us that the roots of this word point to such meanings as mind, destroyer, and great one. Matthew Brown published an article in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies that makes a compelling case for mayhem as destroyer. He wrote that since the Hebrew word maha means destroy, the addition of an n would make the word a noun, mahan, or destroyer. I'm pronouncing it mayhem because I am not a Hebrew scholar, and also because this word's likely meaning makes me think its etymology has to intersect with mayhem somewhere along the line. Satan as a destroyer is consistent with other scriptures across our canon, which describe him using destructive language. I mean, if God's purpose is to bring about our immortality and eternal life, Satan's purpose would be to destroy that. I think it would not be a stretch to say that the great secret Satan probably teaches his followers is how to accomplish his purpose of destruction. So after Cain bound himself to Satan with an oath, accompanied by the threat of destruction if he revealed this action, he obtained his new name. It sounds to me like Cain obtained the title of Master Mayhem because he had been taught how to become a destroyer himself, and that was manifested in Abel's murder. So now let's look at the second man who became Master Mahan by entering into covenant with Satan. Lamech was one of Cain's direct descendants. He was born into the family that had been cast out of God's presence. The scriptures give us his lineage. And in this recitation, they note something different about Lamech. Lamech took two wives. Now, I guess some could argue that this is only a slight alteration of what God established with the creation of Adam and Eve, but... Isn't that the whole point? That's exactly why it's evil, why it's a textbook perversion. He took an eternal principle of God, altered it slightly, then tried to pass it off as having the same worth. Up until this moment in Earth's history, man and woman are equals. Families were only formed with equal representation at the head. But now, here's this new idea that a man can have two wives. And not just have, but take wives, right? Because Adam never took Eve. Eve was brought before Adam, but we see in Moses that Cain took one of his brother's daughters to wife, and Lamech as well took wives, as if they were things to be acquired. I know some might push back on my interpretation of that verbiage, but I don't think we've looked closely enough at this story. 
And in our quest for truth, we must be willing to reconsider our assumptions about the meaning of scriptural texts and question the things that have caused us to be so confident in our conclusions about who women are and how we should be treated. Previous to this moment when Lamech takes two wives, and I have to point out it is nice that we get their names, Ada and Zillah, but prior to this moment when Lamech takes Ada and Zillah as his wives, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve had divided two and two in the land. Notice nobody's taking anybody. And as pairs, they tilled the land, tended flocks, and also begat sons and daughters. And so this moment, you can put a pin in this moment where Lamech takes two wives when the law had always and only been one wife. It's the beginning of something truly diabolical. I want you to imagine putting a dye tracer in humanity following this initial act of polygamy. And I think, I think as we go on through the series, you'll be astounded at the havoc this pollution has wrought upon God's children throughout the course of human history. Because Lamech learned how to do something that completely outdid Cain's wickedness. As Master Mahan, Lamech knew about destroying sacred things and how to use that destruction to enrich himself. But Lamech didn't just destroy life like Cain. He went beyond that. Lamech had full confidence that his evil acts had actually topped Cain's, that he had become more beloved to Satan than his ancestor. Lamech said, If Satan shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech shall be seventy and sevenfold. In his not-so-humble opinion, Lamech thinks his wickedness is pretty impressive. But is that just because he killed for the sake of his satanic oath? The scriptural record doesn't give us the backstory about this killing, only that Lamech murdered not for gain, but because he got angry at a young man. There really are infinite possibilities for why Lamech might have been angry at the young man, so angry that he murdered him, but here's one I think that should be considered. Perhaps when Lamech took two wives for himself, a young man was left without one. Perhaps this young man didn't like his elder taking more than his fair share, and perhaps he pushed back about that. Lamech wouldn't have needed to kill this young man to gain his wives. He'd already taken them. But it doesn't take much creativity to imagine how a polygamous man who has covenanted with Satan would react to a young, younger man taking issue with his acquisitions. Regardless of the details of the murder, though, I ask you to consider that perhaps Lamech's wickedness exceeded Cain's for the following reason. Lamech didn't just learn how to destroy life for gain. He also learned how to destroy marriage and how to destabilize society. In establishing this perversion of marriage that is polygamy, Lamech actually learned how to destroy humanity. And now we get to what I think is so utterly tragic about this story of the man who started polygamy. The Genesis account of Lamech is sparse compared to the one in our selections from the Book of Moses. The details provided in our Latter-day Saint scriptures make it absolutely clear that polygamy was not instituted by God. It wasn't even instituted by those who love God. Polygamy's establishment was an attempt to destroy the holy order of matrimony by one who had covenanted obedience to Satan. The seed of polygamy then was planted by the, the destroyer himself. But out of all the Christian churches in the world, which is the first one that people think of when they hear the word polygamy? Ours. The church that had the most intel, as it were, on the true source of polygamy is the same church that held it up as godly before the entire world. Now, some grace for the saints at the beginning of the Restoration. While they did have the law of the Lord given in 1831, and honestly, it hurts because right there, the Lord explicitly commanded, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shall cleave unto her and none else. So while they did have that, they didn't have the story of Lamech until polygamy was already fully entrenched. 
to explain how that happened, I'm going to draw from Kent Jackson's journal article, How We Got the Book of Moses, and an Enzyme article of the same name by Robert Matthews, both of which I'll link to in the show notes. Joseph Smith's new translation of the Bible was finished by July 1833, and excerpts of it were printed in church newspapers and other places, though here I want to point out that the verses which include the story of Lamech were not among the selections which were printed and distributed to the saints during Joseph's lifetime. After the martyrdom, Emma Smith received possession of these manuscripts from Joseph's new translation, and she subsequently gave them to her children. Eventually, they became the property of the reorganized church, or the RLDS church. That meant that in the decades after Joseph's death, the Latter-day Saints in Utah lacked access to the manuscripts of the new translation, and they only had limited knowledge about how they were produced because none of the participants in the translation process were with the church when the saints moved west in 1846. So those saints who had moved to Utah only had the printed, um, those printed excerpts. In July 1851, Elder Franklin D. Richards, who was a member of the Council of the Twelve and was serving as president of the British Mission, he compiled the revelations that had been published and arranged them piecemeal in a pamphlet he called The Pearl of Great Price. Elder Richards explained in the preface that he had published the pamphlet in order to make these revelations more readily available. Since most members of the church in Britain had been converted within the previous four years, and did not have access to the periodicals formerly printed in the United States. And again, here I want to note that since the story of Lamech was not part of the printed excerpts during Joseph's lifetime, it was also missing from that 1851 Pearl of Great Price. In 1867, so 16 years after the initial printing of the Pearl of Great Price, the RLDS Church used all of the original manuscripts of Joseph's new translation to publish the inspired version of the Bible. And that RLDS publication ended up being a real gift for the Utah Saints because our church historian, Elder Orson Pratt, was able to use that to edit and rearrange the Pearl of Great Price to include all the missing Moses material. And Lamech's story was part of that. And then that was published in Salt Lake in 1878 as the second edition of the Pearl of Great Price. So, that's a long way of saying this information about polygamy being established by a man who had covenanted with Satan. That really didn't get on the saint's radar until a full 26 years after Doctrine and Covenant section 132 was presented to the church. By the time that second edition of the Pearl of Great Price was published, the church was already full throttle on polygamy. But when they read those verses in Moses, I honestly wonder how the saints navigated that. To me, the template of creation with its dual witnesses of the scriptural record and our flesh, those witnesses are extremely authoritative. So when I add in the witness of who started polygamy, it looks pretty open and shut to me. Polygamy is not of God. It never has been, and it never will be. It's a, it's a violation of divine law. But if that's true, then we have a real problem because that's not our church doctrine. That said, it may not be as bad as we think because as I mentioned in my episode, Why Does It Matter? Our doctrine on polygamy has changed a lot. There was a time when it was taught that polygamy would prevent a man from exaltation. Then there was a time when it was taught that polygamy was necessary for exaltation. And now we say, in essence, that polygamy is potentially optional, but probably not necessary for exaltation. So if we consider how drastically things have already changed, perhaps another change would not be quite as problematic as we fear. And if you're a member of the church who's starting to feel like, no, 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 polygamy cannot be from Satan because that would mean insert terrible consequence for the church and my entire worldview here. I'd like to ask you to pause that thinking for a minute while I tell you something about my husband's and my courtship. We knew each other for about a year before we finally started dating, um, really dating. And that was because I was totally confident throughout, um, throughout just getting to know each other and going on dates here and there, completely confident. I knew deep down that he was not the right guy for me. 
I knew like way down in my heart that I did not want to marry him. Um, my reasons weren't very good, <laughs> but um, at the moment it felt like a really true impression that I, that I just knew. And so when I started to change my mind and think, well, maybe I should, I kept going back to that feeling of, no, I know I don't want to marry him. I know he's not the right guy for me. Um, again, we have five kids now. And so I feel like I've sufficiently repented for that. But in that time, I just knew it. So I kind of would go back and forth about dating him because um, something in me just kept getting pulled toward him. But then I would think, no, I'm not, I'm not going to marry him. So I definitely shouldn't go out with him. Anyway, I was having one of these back and forth moments when my roommate, my roommate, Mary, who I love for telling me this, she said, you know what? I think you should just date him for a month. Just give it a chance. And even if two weeks into it, you're hating it and you don't like him, just give it the full month. Because every day you think about it, you try to figure out if you're going to marry him. But you guys haven't even really gone out and given this relationship a chance. So just give it a month and see. And when she said that, it was like a light went on inside. Yes, that's what I can do. I don't have to decide if I'm going to marry him. I can just go out with him. And then at the end of the month, if I really don't like him anymore, we'll just break up. Um, and I did tell him that at the beginning of our dating. And he was, it was a really funny conversation. Um, but suffice it to say, two days into dating him, I was like, oh, we're not breaking up after a month. This is the best relationship I've ever been in in my life. So that's kind of what I want to ask that you do. If you're someone who keeps coming back to this polygamy issue, you keep noticing how problematic it is, but you know, like deep down in your heart that you do not want to marry this idea that polygamy is actually from Satan and is not godly at all, ever, I would ask you to do the same thing that my roommate advised me. Just date this idea for a month. You don't have to know or testify that polygamy comes from Satan. Just experiment upon this idea. See if this perspective begins to enlighten your mind and become delicious to you. And even if you're hating the implications two weeks in, Give it a full month. You can't know what the fruit will taste like until you're first willing to plant the seed and then nourish it with your faith. And you'll be able to tell if the seed is, is good long before it bears fruit, right? Alma taught us this. So just give it a month. I know this idea can be extremely disorienting, but I think we can learn something from our converts. In her book, Mormon Women at the Crossroads, which I'll link to in the show notes, Caroline Klein interviewed a Southern black sister, Nadine, who shared a bit about how she navigated polygamy and other issues when she was considering joining the church. Here's what Nadine had to say about this. What I eventually used was the principle of personal revelation, which I had believed as a Baptist and which was key to me in looking at the LDS faith. I prayed and the answer I received was that neither the priesthood ban and the temple ban nor polygamy had been of God. Joseph Smith said that the key part of our religion is the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and that everything else, everything else was all just appendages to that key tenant. And I was like, I could go for that. And you know, all these other things, they're appendages. So I don't really have to worry my head about that. I had already received clear revelation that the priesthood ban and the temple ban and polygamy were not of God, so I could join the church. We don't have to leave the church if polygamy is not of God. We just have to be willing to let go of our false beliefs. Thank you for being here. I hope the sights and sounds of nature reminded you of how beautiful God's plan is. And thank you for being willing to think about how polygamy started. Next time, we'll discuss how inextricably connected polygamy is to secret combinations. Have a great day. And remember, when we talk about polygamy, there's only one question that really matters. Is it wheat or is it a tear? It can't be both.